communion is very special. It's very dear to Jesus' heart because he's the one that instituted it. He said these words, you know, take the bread that's my body, take the, we don't have wine, but take the cup that's my blood. He said, do it in remembrance of me. And every time someone says yes to Jesus for the first time, they walk into salvation, eternity, leaving the old behind. It's a time of celebration. And today, I want to be very intentional. We have a young man with us. I want to honor him. He, he did not want to come up front. But this past week, uh, well, a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, he came up after service. He stayed around until everybody was gone. And he said, hey, he just had a couple questions about communion and um, shared with him what it was and gave him the salvation message. And I felt like the Lord just say, just let him, I've got this. You know, a lot of times we feel pressured in the moment to try to get someone to say yes. And a lot of times we need to let the Holy Spirit we just deliver the message, and, and uh, this young man, uh, as well as had Cody Fowler talking into his and speaking into his life and encouraging him. And I got a text yesterday that said, "Hey, Caleb prayed a prayer of salvation this week on his own." And I was also so, Caleb, would you be willing to just raise your hand real quick? We celebrate with you today, man. We celebrate. And we're taking communion with him the first time as a believer, as a follower of Jesus. This is a special day. This is good. So let's do it. So do to remember me and give thanks. Father, we give you thanks for what Jesus did, what he was willing to take on and then bear the weight of the cross. And so we take the body and we give thanks and we eat in remembrance. same with the cup. The cup that Jesus said if he didn't have to take it, he would be okay with that, but he was willing to, and the Father said you have to, and he did it, and today we're able to give thanks and remembrance. Father, I thank you for salvation. Missy's coming up. I'm going to do one real quick thing. Would you guys just get up and go high five three people just real quick?
Who thinks size of your car payment versus the car price when considering a vehicle? Who thinks the word budget is a negative word? Have you heard about this thing called inflation? A rumor. How does it make you feel? When you hear that word, Courses through your body, courses through your mind. How many of you are surprised when Christmas shows up in December? How many of you don't look forward to going to the mailbox in January after Christmas? Did you know that money issues are listed as the number one cause for divorce? How many of you out here have heard of FPU, Financial Peace University? Yeah, probably a good percentage of you, okay. It's a nine-week nine course that shows you how to behave with money the way God does. Teach you how to. It'll meet once a week, location and time will be determined yet, but this is just kind of a, let you know it's coming. Coming soon. And uh, we'll need to know how many sign up because we'll get more than 10, to particip 10 households to participate. The price will drop from 100 down to 80 dollars a household. So, anyways, there'll be more information forthcoming. If you've got questions, talk to me or see Missy and she'll send you. question the price, like I have to pay $100 to take a financial aid class, uh, financial, uh, what do we, financial piece class, um, but when you invest in it, you have some skin in the game, it makes a difference. You show up, you do the class, hopefully you do the, do what the class teaches, so. Uh, Jasmine wanted me to remind everyone that there's a children's ministry meeting after church at the ministry house, 211 West Main. It's a block down from Rosini on the left. So, and lunch will be provided. Right, Jazz? Jasmine was supposed to share her vision for children's ministry and hear your input for children's ministry. We are busting at the scene with kids. So, come join Jasmine over at the ministry house. Yeah. Yeah, so the parking is limited because it's right in town, but the Methodist Church parking lot will be open after church. You can park there and walk right across the street. Um, okay, my notes went away. See, paper and pen is good. <laughs> the paper works. Um, youth, we're having a, a multi-church youth event this Wednesday here at the Y, normal time, 5.30. We're going to have pizza and games and partner with some other youth groups. Um, the women's retreat is coming up, Restoring Hope. If you are interested in joining us uh, with, for this retreat, it is June 2nd through the 3rd. It's like 24 hours. If you need the link to register, see me or Michelle Joy. Jen Ricker probably has the link as well. Uh, it's going to be a great time. Vicki's going to do some teaching, worship. Um, it, it's going to be a great weekend. Good food. Come get away. Even if you can only come Friday night or just Saturday, come out and join us. Um, also, we're still doing the baby bottle campaign, Mother's Day through Father's Day. We already partner with Clarity on, uh, with a monthly pledge, but this is a way for all of us to give additionally to that. They do a baby bottle campaign fund. So put your change, bills, or checks in the baby bottles and return them by Father's Day. Uh, I think there's only four left, so we're making good progress. And we're rolling out the new app. I'm so excited because communication is so hard with emails and texts, and this app is going to consolidate all that and our giving. And since I'm not the best person to explain that, Joy is going to.
Okay, if you have a smartphone, doesn't matter if it's Droid or if it's Apple, you can go into your store and you can search for an app. It's really an easy one to find. It's called Encounter Life Ministries. And you download it, right? And when you go into it, it's gonna say subsplash at the bottom and you can't see my screen because you're probably far away, but you will see all of our different ways to connect. In fact is, if you wanna register for the women's events, yeah, you can scan the QR code, which will take you to the, the giving portion of it. But you'll have to go into your store to actually install the app itself. But when you get into it, you can go up to the top right corner and you can set up your profile and get all your stuff set up. And then if you want to register for the web, you go to ELM calendar, kind of goes to the side, you can go to ELM 2023 and there's, it says Restoring Hope Women's Retreat. And it says register here. So if you install the app, it's a quick way to do that. Um, on the app, you will see the home page. You will see a media page, which will take you to, you know, we upload uh, our stuff each week. There's a giving tab, and then there is a Bible tab. So we have a Bible study that you can do uh, on that with us. Very simple, very easy. Um, this is kind of our soft rollout. So we're just giving you exposure to it, letting you download it, install it, put it on your phone, get your profile set up. And then soon we'll start uh, getting like our people suite set up. We'll start getting our small groups set up. And this way we can communicate through all, uh, through all our small groups, through events, for, for Sunday morning, everything that we're doing, really try to streamline that. So uh, there we go. That's it. Any, any questions before I jump any further? Any confusion? If you have confusion, if you're like, I need some help, I don't know, please just come see me, get a hold of me this week, call me, whatever you need to do, right, and so that we can do that. So at this point, we're going to release the kids. Yes, we're going to release the kids. Not you that act like kids, just the actual kids. I'm super excited about this app. We've been working on this for a little while. It took a little bit of a process to get it, get it through the system, and get it approved, and uh, it's gonna make things so much easier and better. All right, everybody good? You guys awake? Alive and well? All right, we're gonna continue. Uh, the series is called The Fragrance of Generosity. We're gonna continue this, we're in part two, The Fragrance of Generosity. Uh, remember, we're reading out of John 12. Let's, let's read the word first. John 12, 12, 3 through 7. Then Mary took a 12 ounce jar of expensive perfume. And, and notice that he, he declares it wasn't just any perfume, it was expensive perfume. Made from the essence of nard, and then she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said that perfume was worth a that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor; he was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied, "Leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial." Father, we just come before you right now. We thank you for your word. Father, we ask that you would continue to teach us, grow us, transform us. Father, that we would become more and more in the image of your son, and that we would fulfill all of the things that you have for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, so today is my generosity stretches my faith. My generosity stretches my faith. I say that, and I, when I was putting this together, I, I, in my spirit, I heard some people go, it doesn't stretch my faith. It doesn't stretch your faith. You haven't given enough. You haven't given enough, right? Because it does. It absolutely, 100% stretches our faith. When you understand the cost, that comes along with it, it's 
you remember last week, I, I said it makes you go, woo! And God's response is, whoa, I can do something with this obedience. I can do something with this generosity, right? I, why did I call this the fragrance of generosity? <clears throat> Fragrances, aromas, right? We have them around. It's like you have these moments in your life where there was a fragrance, there was an aroma, there was a smell, and right now it triggers such deep emotion and memories in you. Right, it takes you back. Right, it, it stirs up inside of you. Let me just give you some examples over now. Right, fresh cut grass. Man, it reminds you of a childhood. Like school's out, let's go. We're gonna have fun. Uh, gasoline. I just for me, when I smell gasoline, it reminds me of when we would do boat trips and stuff like that. Chlorine, pine salt, fresh baked cookies, coffee in the morning, salty beach air a mother's perfume, a father's aftershave or cologne, campfires, popcorn, a real Christmas tree, that pine tree smell, the first snow. For me, fall, when the, this is gonna sound crazy, they do, but when I smell the dead, the wind blows through the dead leaves, there's just this smell, and I love fall, and it just reminds me of fall, and it stirs up these memories of childhood things, right? Fragrance or aromas or smells create inside of us a connection to a moment in time that was very pivotal or very impactful. And you, when you recall that smell, you can not only, not only do you smell the smell, but you can recall the emotion, right? The memories, the words, the things that were going on. You can recall all of it in such detail. This is what we're getting right now. This is 90 AD, all right? John is writing about the life of Jesus. This is like 60-ish years after this event. When John is writing. And he's like, when he's, when he's writing this, he's, he's saying to the thing, he's saying this things like, when he says it was expensive, he's remembering that, that smell and how expensive and costly it was for her to do that why he was so intentional in those words right this isn't just anything and i still can smell it in my nostrils it stirs up even 60 years later and i will tell you what i get a vision is is him uh seeing people's faces the disgust on judas's face when he said what he said right how about the shock on Thomas's face? We know Thomas's character. He was always shocked by things people did. Kind of in disbelief. I felt like he would have seen the frustration of Peter's face because Peter would have been like, why didn't I think about that? I could have done that. That's how he operated most of his time, right? But I'll tell you what really caught my attention. When we read that scripture, when I say, Jesus replied, leave her alone. I think what he would have been recalling, what John would have been writing down, what he would have been recalling is he's re remembering the fragrance and the aroma filling. He would have heard the sternness of the master's voice going, leave her alone. She did this for me. And calls this emotion up out of him. That's why fragrances are so important. It was costly. It was expensive. He said that. I believe it was one of those moments where it was an awkward moment for everybody in the room, but it was an impactful moment. It was a life-changing moment. It was a powerful moment. When I, when I first became a believer, when I first got saved, I, I had someone tell me, you know, there's in the Bible, there are three offerings. There's the tithe, there's the offering, and then there's the painful offering. It's, it's the offering that, that makes you kind of have some tears with it going, Lord, we got this, right? You got this, we're, we're good. What I'm presenting to you is, it hurts, it's painful. Psalm 126, 
Psalm 126, five through six says this, though we sow with tears, we reap with songs of joy. Sometimes there are offerings that just bring tears because they hurt. Let's read on. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. There are sometimes an offering has a pain to it that brings tears because you're like, you know, we, we did the song today, Trust in God. I asked him to do that song is because offering has a lot to do with trust in God. Because there are times when the, when the Lord, when you're, when you're communing with the Lord and he says, I need you to do this. I've given you resources. I've trusted you. I'm giving you a, as a steward of the resources. And as I'm asking you to do this in obedience, there is the, the flesh of us that goes, I don't know. Lord, I don't know. Like, that's going to hurt. I got some adjustments to make. And we give it, and sometimes we feel guilty, right? Because there's this element of tears as we're handing it in, going, you know, I don't know. And we know we're supposed to trust it, we know we're not supposed to doubt, but yet there's it is there. Because the word says the Lord loves a cheerful giver, right? And we hold on and we, we do that. It's like, I'm supposed to be cheerful, but this hurts. And I think that we need to remember that. I think you, I want you to remember Psalm 126 when there's a moment when the Lord says, I want you to do something. You're like, this is painful, this hurts. And maybe you're feeling tearful and maybe you're feeling a little afraid. You're, a little, you're not sure. But as you do it, the word tells me that when I sow in tears, I reap in joy and dancing. That's the promise we hold on to, right? You know, it's that, it's that tear that says, this is going to affect my life. This is going to cause me to move some things around. And please hear me. I'm not talking about responsibility. I'm not talking about you don't feed your kids or you, you don't pay the mortgage in order to bring an offering to the house. I'm talking about offerings that when you are talking to the Lord and you're being in obedience and he says, I want you to do this. If you're like... I got $5, Lord, and I need to go buy some macaroni and cheese. You got to talk to him about it. Because if he says, I'm going to give you, I've got more than macaroni and cheese planned for you. Will you just trust me for the moment? Sow the seed. Sow the seed. I got this. They're not eating till 4 o'clock this afternoon. Watch me work. So please don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about taking money away from your responsibilities. I'm talking about, I said it, excuse me, I said it last week, I'm talking about an offering that gets your attention because when it gets your attention, it gets his attention, right? When it moves you, it moves him. Like it's, a, like it's an offering, it's something that you're talking to him about because you have to think about it, which means he's thinking about it, right? It's that offering that requires faith. Giving always stretches our faith. Let me explain why. Ten dollars, ten thousand dollars, ten million dollars. It doesn't matter wherever you roll. If you're rolling in the ten million dollars, please come see me. We need to talk, but no, I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. <clears throat> it doesn't matter what the dollar figure is. Okay? Your giving will always require faith because here's what happens. You will look at that money and you will think there is something you can do with that money for you besides give it away. Right? $10. I could go have two lattes with this depending on where you go. Okay, just one and some change. Inflation. $10,000. That's a dream vacation or maybe something towards your dream car. $10 million. That means you've got to make some adjustments, move some things around. You've got to put some things over here to here to here in order to readjust. There's going to be a big effect. It doesn't matter the dollar amount. There is always going to be a stretch of your faith because you're going to think what you could do with it. 
God always works that way, right? And we're flesh. Because we're flesh, that's a natural thought process for us. And that's why we go $10. The Lord wants me to give $10. And we immediately go, but I could use this on me. And then we'll even get real spiritual with God. God, I could buy him a latte. I could buy the person behind me a coffee while I give myself a coffee. I'm going to pay it forward today. I'm going to bless someone, Lord. Did he tell you to do that? I think a lot of times we do noble things and they're great, but I think I, I, what I'm stretching us to is we need to be asking the Lord, what do you want me to do with my actions, my words, and my finances today? I don't want to do noble things. I want to do God things. Okay? So, let's go back to the Garden of Eden just for a moment. Let's, let's look at Adam and Eve, right? Satan enters into the picture and he looks at them and he says, God doesn't want you to have that tree right there. He doesn't want you to have the tree. And what do Adam and Eve do? Instead of looking at all of the things that they have and going, I don't really need that tree. Well, he doesn't want us to have that tree. They got transfixed on the tree. They got transfixed on the thing that they didn't have. They got transfixed on the thing that God said, you don't need to have that. Why would he not want us to have that? I want that. And we're an awful lot like Adam and Eve, where there are things in your life that God has not released or he has not placed in, and we look at it and we go, but I want that. But I need that. And we get really focused on all the things that we don't have instead of being thankful for what we do have and trusting God that we'll use everything that we, we have for him, not for our personal pleasure. Does that mean he doesn't want you to have fun? No. Does that mean he doesn't want you to have desires in your heart? No. Does that mean he doesn't want you to enjoy things? No. He wants to make sure that you don't get focused on the thing that God didn't give you and get focused on what he did give you and how you use it to its fullest potential. Right? And when it comes to giving, when it comes to our offering, when it comes to tithe, when it comes to any form of giving, the voice of the enemy gets in you and goes, you're losing, you're losing out. You give that away, you won't get it back. You won't have it. It won't be there for you. But I need you to remember, we're not losing, we're sowing. Psalm 125, we are sowing. Anything that we give away, we don't lose. We are sowing. I wrote this down. No farmer has ever thrown seed in the ground and thought, I lost it. It's gone. I'm going to starve. They sow seed. It requires patience. It requires some faith. To allow what they can't see happening to work its way to where they see it working. Our giving takes faith. I should think about this. When I read this passage, when I read this scripture, right? The moment she gave, two voices spoke. Every time you give, every time I give, every time we give, two voices will always speak. Okay? The first one we know, Judas, right? The enemy, the devil. It's your enemy and your inner me. Think about that. The Holy Spirit inside of you wants to talk. And there's an inner me in you. It's talking out of emotions the devil uses, right? Okay? And often we don't know which one is which, but they're both talking. First voice, this is what it'll say. First voice with your, with your offering, with your giving, with your generosity. First voice will say things like this. Why this waste? 
You're an idiot. What have you done? Why would you do that? The enemy will always do what Judas did to her. Delegitimize her offering. Delegitimize her generosity. The crazy thing, this is how the devil works. This is how his lies work. Note, it came after she gave, not before. That voice always comes after, never before, right? Why? Well, so tomorrow's the 22nd. We're always thinking about the next day. We're always thinking about tomorrow. When we give, we're thinking about the next day. So today, maybe you woke up and you said, tomorrow I'm starting to diet, I'm going keto, I'm, you know, meat, 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 whatever, no breads, no carbs, I'm like doing, I'm going for it. And there's all this energy and there's all this excitement and you're just fired up and you're telling everybody. Tomorrow morning, when you wake up, you go, man, a bagel sounds really, really good right now. When we're in the moment, the enemy's like, let them be in the moment. Let them, let them plan for it. Let them get into it. Just go ahead. And then when tomorrow happens, when you actually do what you say you're going to do, you, you, start, you take that step of faith, you take that first move, that's when the enemy begins to speak. Why would you do that? You'll never make it. That's silly. Right? It's easy before you do it, right? Before you give. But once the moment she did it, once the moment you do it, the enemy comes in with these waste, wrong, mistake, silliness. I, I'm just going to be honest. There have been times, there have been offerings, there have been things that, that we've done where I was so excited, and as soon as we did it, I'm telling you, that voice just came on me. Why would you do that? That was just silly. What a waste. It's gone. You'll never get it back. And I have, you know what the words I have to say? I have to say to the in, in, inner me, the enemy, it's not waste. I'm sowing seed. I literally have to say those words. I have to remind them, my inner me, I have to remind my flesh, my, my body, my mind, will, and emotions, I have to remind it that this is scriptural and I'm sowing. Amen. Thank you. But there will always be a voice of Judas and he will always try to talk you out of it. Okay? There will always be the voice of the enemy. And that voice will always be telling you that God is withholding something from you. And it'll get you to say, when or if, when we get that kind of money, when we get into that kind of place, when I get that job, if we get here, then we'll do it. It's always the if-then clause. That's the, how the enemy works, if and then. And God says, now and watch. Now and watch. I like his math a lot better. He tries to shame her for her generosity because there is always warfare in the offering. There is always warfare in the offering. Right? He tries to make her feel stupid for her giving. And, and, and if you're a giver, and I'm going to assume that everybody is a giver, you have had these feelings before. You have experienced these emotions before. And I want you to understand, I want to make sure you know it's a natural thing because it's natural, but when we give, it's supernatural and we have to change our mindset from I'm losing to I'm sowing. Right? I'm not wasting, I'm sowing. So what's the B clause? The B clause is the enemy never shames you out of stupid purchases. Just saying. I, I was thinking of some examples, but I thought of this. I was like, oh, that, they're going to think I'm telling them they made a stupid purchase. I'm like, I can't do that. And then I had this one, and I had this. So I do have a couple. Let me just throw a couple things out to you, right? No one has ever purchased a brand new car, got off the lot into the street, go, that was the best investment I've ever made. 
right? Because we know the reality. Well, there just went 30%, boom. Here's another, this is a silly one, right? But the, the enemy never says to you, uh, hey, you should go ahead and get that $80 worth of popcorn at the movie today. The reason why that's funny is because most of us are fairly hood when it comes to the movie theater. Let me explain why, right? You got like a $2,000 Louis Vuitton purse and you've got it stuffed with Diet Coke, M&M's, popcorn, all the other stuff. You're like sneaking it in. So you look classy, you look bougie, but you're hood just like the rest of us. calls it waste. He asks, why this waste? Why would you do this? Right? That's the first voice. I love the second voice. Right? That other voice, it's the powerful voice that has sternness, has authority behind it. Right? It's that voice that said, let there be light. It's the voice that created the heavens and the earth. It's the voice of Malachi 3 that said, I will rebuke the devourer for your, uh, for your sake. It's the voice of John 1, right? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. There's another voice that spoke you into existence in your mother's womb. It's the voice of God Almighty, and here's what the voice always says, leave her alone. Judas, don't mess with her. Devil, don't mess with them. Leave them alone. I've got a purpose for this. And they're doing it for me. Remember last week? Our generosity honors Jesus. See, when we get in that moment where the enemy starts going, waste, silliness, why would you do that? We gotta remember, my giving, my generosity, I'm doing this because it honors him. I'm sowing because it's he tells me to, and it hurts, and it's painful, but it's not wasteful. I, I love it because when we look at the two voices, we listen to Jesus' voice, right? I want you to hear this. When the next time the enemy begins to have this thought process to you, and this conversation with you, I want you to remember that what Jesus' voice is saying, that's not waste, that's worship. Okay, that's not foolish, that's generosity. You're calling them stupid, I call them walking with wisdom. You're saying it's disappearing, I'm saying it's a seed, man, it's a seed. And I can work with seed. I can do something with seed. And then what he's gonna say to you is, you may not see it right now, but I promise you, it's producing because my word says it is. And I cannot go from my word. I have to stay with my word. I promise you it's producing. What she did was not just the gift of faith in the moment, all right? Jesus said, she did this in preparation for my burial. So think about this, right? doesn't only require faith now to actually take the step forward, right? But it takes faith to remember that it is creating a harvest for your future. That's the faith. There's the first element of faith that says, I'm gonna do this. And then as soon as you do it, and the enemy begins to attack your brain and your, your thoughts. Then your faith kicks in and goes, that has nothing to do with right now. That's in preparation for what's ahead. My act of obedience was for now. Now my faith kicks in for what's ahead. I'm looking to the future. And I love it because what Jesus is saying to Judas is you're thinking about right now, I'm thinking about the cross. You're thinking about right now, I'm thinking about souls, salvation. Remember last week I talked a little bit about giving here and giving there, how when we give here, 
We give to man, we give to mortal man, and we do things with it. But it, according to scripture, it literally goes into the hands of Jesus. So it's that thought process of my giving does not stay here. My giving goes into my future, according to God's word. Her giving was significant because her giving was connected to the cross and it was connected to salvation. Our giving is connected to the cross and it's connected to salvation. Not just things. Can you remember that? Can you remember that? All right. It, it wasn't just about the moment. It was about the moments to come. And I said this last week, but I'm going to say it again. I'll probably say it again the next time. Right. My giving speaks to God because when I give, God speaks for me. I'm going to have the worship team come up. I'm going to have a couple testimonies here in a minute. We didn't put the black box out. I asked you not to put the black box out. I'm not, we don't, if you're visiting, we, we don't pass a bucket or we don't take up offering that way. I believe the offering is between you and the Lord. And um, I want you to give in the manner that you're called to give, whether it's a, a check or cash or something in the low in the black box or you give on give online or you give digitally or electronically. The black box is out because this is my challenge to you as you go out today. Is that your offering, your tithe would not just be out of ritual or habit. I'm so grateful and thankful for generous giving and in your obedience and your faithfulness. But I, I wanted you to have a little bit of a different heart th today and this week. That is, as you go out, if, if you're going to drop the, your offering or your giving into the box, that you would be able to say, I trust you, God. And this stretches my faith. Even if you're normally like, well, we just account for this. This is just our normal. This is what we do. This is it. I, I want to change it from this is just no, this is just it to God. This stretches my faith because you have a purpose for it. I, I'm sowing intentionally because you've called me to do it. I, I'm going to do it in obedience to you. I, I'm giving you the opportunity for you to do your thing. Because I'm doing my thing. You to do your part because I'm doing my part. And you don't go against the promises of your word. If you give electronically, right, you give on your phone, whatever it is, or maybe you have it set up on reoccurring, and then you're like, well, I don't give on Sunday, I wait till Wednesday because that's when stuff goes in. Whenever that moment is for you, whenever you're doing that, or you know that reoccurring is going to happen. Like I have a set up, you know, I didn't, we don't. But if you're a person that says, we have a set up Tuesday mornings, it goes out. Like before it goes out, I want you to be able to say the same thing. If you've got to speak to your device. But, but uh, the same thing, that heart that says, I trust you, God. I trust in you. And I, I'm doing this in obedience. And it stretches my faith. But I'm sowing, not just for a return. I'm not giving the gift. I'm sowing because you told me to. And I'm waiting, I'm looking. I know that there's gonna be a day when the joy and the singing and the dancing is gonna happen. But right now, it feels a little painful. you would be able to say, I trust you, God. I trust you. I have a couple testimonies and then we're going to go back into worship.
I am a real estate agent, and so my um, taxes are not taken out. I'm self-employed, like many of you probably are, and I'm supposed to be diligent to take out a quarter of whatever I make, you know, to set it aside so that when tax time comes around, my life doesn't pass before my eyes. But I never do that. And so this year, when tax time rolled around, and I saw how much we owed, my life passed before my eyes, and I went, woo! <laughs> and um, it was a pretty, I mean, it was a great real estate year, so praise the Lord for that, right? But when it's a great real estate year, then that just means there's a big fat tax bill that is, comes due in April. And um, I'm trying really hard to live in a place of being kingdom-minded, recognizing that there is a realm that we are to operate in that we don't see. And so I'm trying really hard to operate my life according to the principles of the kingdom. And so even though that number made my life pass before my eyes, I said to the Lord, okay, this does not surprise you, and I'm going to trust you. And I remember there was a time that you sent Peter to the sea and told him to throw out a line and catch a fish, and in that fish there would be a coin, and it would be enough to pay for your taxes and for Peter's taxes. So I'm just asking for a fish with a coin. And I know that's a stupid thing, um, but I have a habit of asking God for stupid things, and he shows up on the regular. So um, we, we had to get a home equity line of credit to pay our tax bill. And um, then last Sunday after church, after Corey taught on generosity and the faithfulness of God, I got home from church and Bobby said, hey, come out to the office. And so he sat me down in his office chair and pulled up our um, bank account statement. And there was a deposit in our bank account for almost exactly that outrageous number that we had to pay our taxes. And I said, where in the world did that money come from? I mean, it was it was a stupid number. And he, um, Bobby was in the National Guard for, gosh, I don't know, 150 years. And um, he retired from the Guard, but he still works his normal job. And we thought that he didn't qualify to get his Guard retirement until this August. But it turns out, because God is so cool, he was eligible to start collecting his guard retirement last August. And so the, the combined total that they back paid him from last August till now was a coin in a fish's mouth. <laughs> I mean, God is just, I could not have seen that coming. I could not have made that up. I, I mean, I just, it wasn't anywhere in my frame of reference to imagine, but I asked, you know, and a lot of times the word says you have not because you ask not, so I'm just going to encourage you to ask big for stupid things because God is so faithful, and I mean, it's nothing that we did. Yeah, he, he worked really hard, and he was due that retirement, but we didn't think he was due that retirement until this August, but because God is ridiculously we got the amount that we needed to be able to pay those taxes. And I, I just, I'm flabbergasted. I was telling this to a friend a couple weeks ago. Well, no, just earlier this week. And she said, that stuff happens to you all the time. Does it ever get old when God does that? And I said, never. Never. Every single time he shows up, I am flummoxed. I am just gobsmacked every single time. So praise God. He is so good. Praise God. Now, what she did, I want to, I want to say that um, they are incredibly generous. The ministry house that we meet at for youth and for small, like lots of different, like when they they bought that house and they had a plan and God said, no, I want you to do this, and they are they are so gentle. They let anybody and everybody meet there. They just open it up. I've watched them live a generous life. I've watched them walk that out, right? I don't know anything about their giving, their tithing. 
I just know that they're generous in everything that they do. And, and I, I promise you that that obedience, that's that favor. That's the craziest thing. And I would never get tired of God doing that either. Right? I would never do that. So. Okay, so every year I go to a trade show in, o in Ohio. And it's where I buy all my Christian stuff and things. And so I've been doing this for about 17 years. But I ask um, a person who I feel is in spiritual authority over me to pray for me before I go. And for the last two or three years, it's been corn. And Amy goes with me every year. So sometimes the Lord will give me a word about something, and I think, okay, that's great. And it just sits there. And then later on in time, something comes about, and that word comes back into my mind of what it's for. So Amy and I were driving down the road, and there's a lot of farmland in Ohio, and I saw the farmland, and I told Amy, I said, hey, look, those farmers, they're getting ready to prepare their land for their crops. And some land was not worked yet. It still had stuff like weeds and whatever that they have. And Amy said, yeah, I'm a farmer. And I thought, that's right, Amy. A farmer is kind of like an equal to, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. So God's supposed to supply for me. But then there were two fields, several fields. And some was harvest to get ready for the seed, and some wasn't. But the same farmer, the same type of person, a farmer, was with those seeds. So I have a little story for you. One farmer, he went to the, to the ground and he toiled the ground. He pulled the weeds out, he cultivated it, he worked it, he nourished it, and then he got ready to plant his seed. And the other farmer just stood there at his land and said, I have this land, I'm gonna be able to get a harvest. Well, the first farmer, he kept working his land as he planted his seeds weeds would try to come up and he'd pull out those weeds. Then when harvest time came, the man who had worked his field, he had a harvest. He planted corn seeds, so he got corn. He planted green beans, so he got green beans. He planted strawberries, so he got strawberries. What seeds you plant is what you would reap because the word says what you sow, you reap. Well, then the man who did it, he got irate, irate and angry because he wasn't getting a harvest when the harvest time came. But I'm a farmer, he says. I'm a Christian. God's supposed to supply for me. I'm a farmer. My land is supposed to supply for me. But see, it didn't because he didn't work the land. He did not plant the seed. He expected it to just manifest for itself. And when I was looking at these fields, I told Amy, I said, you know, Amy, the Lord said to me about a month ago, this is before Corey started preaching about the seed stuff. The Lord said to me, people are expecting a harvest on a seed that they have not sown. And when he said that to me, I thought, okay, because I plant seeds. I know other people plant seeds. You know, my shop times, which I've been told by many people, it doesn't have to, but it does. And see, I took a course called Crown Ministries with Jim Allen, which is similar to what you're going to do. It's a very essential thing to do. And I planted, I learned to plant seeds a long time ago, and I do it even through the shop. I may give somebody $100, I may give somebody $500, I may give somebody $1,000, I, whatever it is. But I do that to plant a seed so that I can still get a harvest, so that I still have a shop open so I can give more. Are you planting a seed? If you want money, if you need finances, plant money. If you need food, maybe you can get to a food bank and you'll find out you'll get food back. What you plant is what you're gonna sow. I do want to share something. 
um, just a short testimony. This past week, I felt led to give to a friend who was in need, and it was an act of faith because I had to have faith that it was going to be used towards what it was said it was going to be used for. for. And then I sat outside and I gave some fears to the Lord that had been rising up in me towards some things that He had promised me. That's just personally separate from the giving, and so I gave financially and I gave and my burdens to the Lord. And this is all during nap time, so we got to love nap time. Um, and then my father-in-law stopped by randomly to share a testimony, some good news that was happening to him. And he was like, I'm so happy, I just want to give somebody money. <laughs> so then he handed me some cash that was four times the amount that I gave to my friend that was basically the amount of a bill that I needed to pay later that day. And so um, I love all the testimonies and Trusting the Lord is an honor, and He is always faithful, and He always comes through. already growing and you're going to sow it there 
So sometimes, you know, you got to think about what to invest in. So if you're stuck, take your seed, get with Holy Spirit, find out where that where the perfect conditions are for that seed to produce the harvest that you need.